Good evening and a, a warm welcome on a very cold Canberra night. Thank you all for coming. I think we're all fortunate to be here. I'm John Beaton, the executive director of this academy, and I would like to introduce our president, Professor Deborah Terry, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. It's now my honour and privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Gary Banks, AO, Dean and CEO of the Australia and New Zealand School of Government, ANZOG. I know that Professor Banks needs no introduction to many of you, but uh, just to, to give some background uh, before he starts his lecture. Since his ince its inception in 1998 to his retirement in 2012, Professor Banks chaired the Productivity Commission. And it's widely agreed that under his leadership, the Commission became Australia's most respected independent source of policy advice and analysis to government. During this time, the Productivity Commission not only focused on economic reform and productivity, but broadened its focus to bring economic perspectives and insights to bear on policy responses to our most pressing social issues. These included problem gambling, Indigenous disadvantage, aged care and disability services. And in the latter area, the Commission provided the background work that led to the new National Disability Insurance Scheme, which I'm sure commentators will look back on as a watershed development that helped to shape a stronger Australian society. In his role as Chair of the Productivity Commission, P Professor Banks was an articulate and passionate advocate of a comprehensive agenda to drive productivity, arguing for greater workplace flexibility and an internationally competitive incentive and policy framework underpinned by stronger and more effective education and innovation systems. Following his retirement as chair of the commission, Professor Banks was appointed professorial fellow at the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research. He has also been appointed adjunct professor at the Australian National University. And he's chaired the regulatory policy committee of the OECD since early 2012, and he's an occasional lecturer at the Melbourne Business School in its public policy program. In earlier years, Gary worked at the Centre for International Economics in Canberra. He's been a consultant to the OECD and World Bank and a visiting fellow at the Trade Policy Research Centre in London. In 2007, he was made an officer of the Order of Australia for services to the development of public policy in microeconomic reform. And in 2010, he was elected a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. With such an outstanding record as an insightful, persistent and effective champion of evidence-based economic reform and public policy, I can't think of a more appropriate person to deliver the inaugural Peter Carmel lecture. And Professor Carmel, I have no doubt, would be delighted with our choice. So please join me in welcoming Professor Gary Banks. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Professor Terry. Um, I feel really privileged to have been invited to give this inaugural lecture uh, in the series in memory of, of Peter Carmel. Uh, Professor Carmel's important contributions to public policy in Australia are well known and have been well summarised uh, this evening by uh, Barry McGaw. The Academy of the Social Sciences tribute is a fitting one, which should in itself uh, make a useful contribution to public policy discussion in the years ahead. For this first lecture, I've chosen to focus on a key strand of Peter Carmel's own contribution, namely the role of public inquiries in securing better public policy. Professor Carmel led or participated in a number of such inquiries throughout his career, as you heard, a notable early example being his influential 1973 report on school funding for the Whitlam government. Well, as a young uh, economics graduate newly enlisted in the public service, I took a close interest in the Carmel Review and subsequent developments, but it wasn't until a few uh, decades later, uh, as a member of an education committee myself, the West Review of Higher Education Policy, that I first got to meet Peter Carmel in person. Characteristically, he'd asked to meet with the committee to warm us to the themes contained in his forthcoming submission. At that time, he was not in good health, but he made a very strong impression on the committee. And the thinking in his submission had a significant influence on our subsequent report, titled Learning for Life. 
What stood out was not just the power of his mind and the skill with which he constructed his case, but the resolute concern for the public interest, a concern that was often less apparent uh, in other submissions. Well, it seems timely to be reflecting on the role of public inquiries. For one thing, we've seen an unprecedented number of them in recent years, in part resulting from the hyperactivity of the first Rudd administration. For another, the federal opposition has foreshadowed a good deal more, should it win government in a couple of months' time. Some of those reviews will be traversing territory covered by previous reviews, which raises questions about their value. Moreover, notwithstanding all this review activity, there's arguably never been a time when there's been so much contention and division about so many important public policy issues. This stands in contrast to the experience of the economic reform era of the 1980s and 90s, when public inquiries underpinned all the major reforms, yielding large and enduring benefits. The Asprey Tax Review, Campbell Financial Markets Inquiry, and Hilmer Competition Review being just three of these. Well, what if anything has changed? Have public inquiries lost some of their ability to foster successful public policies? Policies that not only do good, but are accepted as such? And if so, does it matter? And what, if anything, can be done about it? These are some of the questions I'd like to address uh, in this lecture tonight. Now, it'll be obvious that the perspectives I bring are coloured by personal experience, particularly from many years spent at the Productivity Commission and its predecessors, but also by my involvement in the aforementioned West Review of 97, and the Prime Minister's Regulation Task Force in 2006. And one of the more basic practical insights that I gained early on in the inquiry game, as I call it, was that very few people actually read inquiry reports. And no one, except perhaps the hapless review chair, reads them in their entirety. Those with least time of all to read inquiry reports are the ministers to whom they are directed who as a result tend to rely on the interpretations of others. Well, with this in mind, the, the Productivity Commission introduced the innovation of a key points box at the front of every one of its reports. And that's how I shall commence this lecture, for I fear that I've again broken the 10-page rule. So I have seven key points, which I'll state right now. The first is that public inquiries can be a powerful device for securing better policies. The second is that there's an increasing need for them. And thirdly, they can be of particular value to an incoming government. But their contribution is not assured and it has varied greatly in the past. How successful inquiries can be depends on how they are framed and constituted and how well a government handles their reports. The next point is that it's also important that not too many reviews are undertaken at once. So finally, getting the best out of public inquiries can be challenging. But I'd have to say that the recent policy record in sensitive areas suggests that even poor inquiries may sometimes be preferable to the alternative. Well, to begin now at the beginning, the essence of a public inquiry or other reviews, task forces, etc., that I'm going to talk about is that it takes place as a discrete activity with leadership at arm's length from the executive and from policy departments in particular. It's appointed by and provides recommendations to government, but it has no power uh, or role in relation to their implementation or subsequent administration. In other words, it provides policy relevant information and, and advice at the front end of the policy cycle and on a take it or leave it basis. Key features of, the, of that advice are its publicness. It responds to public terms of reference, draws on public submissions, and is ultimately made public. Well, it seems self-evident from the extensive use of public inquiries that governments see considerable value in them. Their motivations from a policy perspective vary, however, generally falling into one of three categories. Firstly, to vindicate or substantiate a policy course already being followed or intended. The review of uh, global financial crisis spending programs in 2010 
or the 2012 review of the Fair Work Act uh, come to mind. Secondly, to determine how preferred policy directions should be specifically framed or designed, and the Productivity Commission's paid parental leave and disability uh, inquiries are examples of that. Or thirdly, to establish what the policy approach in a specific area should be, whether by uh, reviewing existing policies like taxation or addressing a new issue like greenhouse or population ageing. Now, it's sometimes suggested that governments can be motivated more by the desire to avoid having to take policy action, or at least to defer the need for it. And such motives are no doubt real, but they can be subsumed within the others. My principal interest here, however, is not just in how inquiries can help governments get what they want, but rather in how they can help get better outcomes for society. Ultimately, if Harry S. Truman's dictum that good policy is good politics is correct, as I believe it is, there should be little difference, though observed behaviour suggests this may not currently be widely believed. So how in principle might public inquiries be able to contribute to achieving better policy outcomes for society? This is best answered, I think, by considering separately two dimensions of the policy challenge, the technical, determining what to do, and the political, getting it agreed. There's a third dimension, getting it implemented, which is just as important, uh, but not something that I need go into uh, here tonight. Well, contrary to what many seem to think, few solutions to policy problems are self-evident or can be lifted from a textbook or even from another country's practice. Some analysis of the specific nature of the problem and likely impacts of different options, including their interaction with existing policies, will generally be required. Now, this should be core business for the bureaucracy, but depending on the topic, there will not always be the necessary skills on tap, particularly where more specialised or in-depth research is required, nor the capacity or latitude to undertake necessary public consultations. The consequent need for outside help of some kind has arguably increased in recent years. For one thing, the analytical capacity of the bureaucracy appears to have been in decline. Few departments today have in-house research units and generalists have been displacing specialists uh, at those levels of the bureaucracy where policy analysis has traditionally been undertaken. Secondly, the scope for public servants to engage externally on matters related to the development and design of policy appears to have become more circumscribed. There have been a number of mishaps in recent years with unintended consequences that even cursory consultation with business would have helped avoid. In these circumstances, public inquiries provide a means of marshalling dedicated expertise, as well as enabling public consultation on policy options to occur without exposing governments politically. For an incoming government, they offer the further advantage uh, of providing some control over who does the job in circumstances where a new government may feel uncertain about the capability or, or inclination of incumbent bureaucrats, particularly where these help design the policies or programs it wants to change. The National Broadband Network and Carbon Policy come immediately to mind. While public inquiries can in such ways help address technical challenges in policy development, their ability to improve the political environment for policy change is arguably even more important. There are multiple dimensions to this. First, a policy initiative based on the advice of credible outside experts will generally be easier to sell to the public and the parliament. The national competition policy, I think, was a good example of that. Second and related, uh, public inquiry post, uh, processes can serve to educate the public and help build broader support for policy change. And I think the NDIS, which Professor Terry mentioned, uh, is a good example. Third, public inquiries can also diminish the credibility and influence of special interest groups by exposing self-serving arguments and demonstrating adverse impacts on the community. For some reason, gambling comes to mind. Fourth, they can en enable a government to credibly defer taking action in response to an emerging issue 
allowing time for some of the heat or fuss to subside, as well as enabling a more considered response. Executive remuneration is what I put in parentheses after that. Fifth, they can provide an opportunity for government to observe the behaviour of different interest groups and in particular, how they react to different policy proposals, enabling better informed political judgments about what features will ultimately fly. And here I think of lifetime community rating uh, in private health insurance. Finally, in helping governments deliver policies that work and that demonstrably benefit the community, they can engender public support for genuine reform and promote trust in government itself. Well, once again, for an incoming government, public inquiries can have further distinct political advantages. They can provide a credible pretext for modifying problematic parts of a policy platform developed in opposition. And I think this is less utilised than it might be. The paid parental leave issue comes to mind as an opportunity. They can also provide a new government with authority to dismantle a policy introduced by its predecessors in circumstances where this may otherwise be highly contentious or interpreted as merely ideological. In this way, they may secure policy outcomes that are not only in the public interest, but that will also be less vulnerable to reversal with another change in government. It follows that to be judged successful uh, from a, a public interest perspective, an inquiry or review needs to achieve more than having an impact on policy. It needs to do so in a way that can ultimately lead to better outcomes. Now, various examples come to mind of inquiries or at least key recommendations that managed to pass the first test but failed the second one. One of the more recent is the inquiry uh, into coastal shipping, admittedly by a parliamentary committee, which led to legislative changes that may benefit Australian shipmaking and our local marine workforce, but at significant net cost to the Australian uh, economy uh, and, and community. By the same token, there have been many review recommendations that would have met the second test, but didn't clear the first hurdle. The Productivity Commission has a long list of them. You can see my 2012 speech on the to-do list. Um, its inquiry into restrictions on book imports is a recent high profile example. Its recommendation for a public interest test in anti-dumping processes is another. Among some from the Howard government era were the Commission's broadcasting report and its inquiry recommending an end to freight equalisation subsidies for best trade shipping. Now, occasionally a public inquiry will fail on all counts, its recommendations neither being taken forward by government nor likely to benefit the community in the long term. And a very recent example is the Filkelstone inquiry recommendations relating to freedom of the press. So what are the preconditions for a successful inquiry? While the performance of those involved uh, in one is obviously a factor, the most important determinants are in government's own hands. And there are six areas in my view that are particularly important. The first is selecting the right topic. Public inquiries or reviews can involve considerable setup costs and extensive public participation. They therefore need to be reserved for issues that warrant the effort. It follows from points already made that inquiries will generally be best suited to issues that are both technically complex and politically contentious and where there's much at stake for society in getting it right. Complexity alone is unlikely to provide sufficient justification as experts can always be called in without the need for a full-blown inquiry. Scanning the large number of reviews that have taken place after, over the last decade or so, it's hard to find many areas that involve no political sensitivities at all. And most reviews seen in isolation address issues or topics where the benefits from improved policy outcomes would more than outweigh the costs of the reviews. However, the stakes for Australia in these various reviews uh, are very greatly. Perversely, the sheer number of reviews at times has diminished their contribution, including for some of the most important ones. For example, in 2008, 
uh, and nine, in the, in the year 2008-9, major reviews were simultaneously underway for higher education, health and hospitals, taxation, defence, climate change, innovation, quarantine, 457 migration visas, national infrastructure, and assistance to the car and textiles industries. And this is aside from several important inquiries by the Productivity Commission, including into consumer policy, paid parental leave and drought policy, and many others uh, of lesser significance. Well, the failure of some of the most important of these inquiries to realise their potential can no doubt be attributed, at least in part, to the inability of the government to devote the attention to them that they needed, particularly at the crucial response and implementation stage. Arguably, advancing tax reform or health system reform alone on the scale envisaged could have fully occupied the first term of even the most ambitious government. Well, the old saying about asking a silly question is apt for public inquiries. The potential contribution of an inquiry obviously depends on what it is expressly required to report on within a particular area of public policy. It will always be important to the commissioning government that an inquiry be directed, that it not become a happy hunting ground uh, or a loose cannon. However, if it is directed to do unproductive things as part of its brief or is excluded from doing things that from a public interest perspective should be examined, then the inquiry is predestined for failure, or at least to making a lesser contribution uh, than desirable. In some cases, a government may wish to exclude some part of the policy terrain uh, subject to review. And this is procedurally legitimate, of course, and indeed understandable, but for it to avoid debilitating the inquiry, the issues need to be separable and not integral to the main thrust of the review. In the Commission's 1997-98 inquiry into private health insurance, the rest of the health system was ruled out of scope, as at the time the government was res responding to more targeted community concerns to do with price rises for Premier. Now, while this uh, veto was obviously respected, the Commission felt it necessary to consider different possible reform directions for the health machine, as we called it, as a whole, to ensure that recommendations to improve this one cog would be complementary. The Henry Review was presented with a much bigger obstacle in seeking to reform Australia's tax system without being able to recommend changes to the GST. This was not a separable matter, and while the review came up with an alternative proposal for putting more weight on the consumption base in taxation, its report was handicapped and its value diminished. The issue, of course, has not gone away. Indeed, momentum has been building gradually over the past couple of years for the GST to be restored to the tax policy agenda. However, this will now require uh, new policy foundations to be laid and valuable time has been lost. It's said of the art of comedy that timing is everything and the same could be said about public inquiries though provoking laughter is not normally a positive sign. There are several areas uh, where timing can make the difference between success and failure. The most basic of these is choosing the right time to actually hold one. Borrowing another catchphrase, the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. For example, if the political obstacles to desirable change in some policy areas vary inversely with business conditions, it'll generally be better to tackle such areas when conditions are good than when they are bad. I could but appreciate the irony, for example, in the long-awaited National Competition Policy Review of the anti-dumping system, a system which protects uh, uh, produ uh, import competing producers from unfairly low prices, but it was finally being sent to the Productivity Commission in 2010 when an appreciated dollar was placing maximum competitive pressure on local manufacturers. The predictable outcome was the rejection of the Commission's key public interest recommendation, 
and the recasting of the anti-dumping regime to make it more receptive to an industry's complaints about imports, with the opposition actually urging more protectionist amendments still. Right topic, wrong time. For similar reasons, it's not smart to time an inquiry uh, uh, on a sensitive matter such that it will issue its report close to an election. At that point, the report will in inevitably become a political football, regardless of the merits of its recommendations. This, no doubt, was part of the story with the tax review. Compounding factors in that case were that the government had had the report for some six months before releasing it, and then chose to respond only to the politically most contentious recommendations in it, in isolation of other balancing recommendations. There have been plenty of examples over the years of Productivity Commission reports being rejected or responses to them distorted because of a looming election, to the point where the Commission in later years found pretext for delaying the completion of a number of its draft reports. Those on national competition policy and consumer policy come to mind. Both reports were far better received and more influential for having been released just after an election than just before. On the other hand, it can be politically smart to initiate an inquiry in the lead up to an election. The government is thereby seen to be taking an issue seriously while ensuring that no action will be necessarily until the next term and possibly by the other side. At the Productivity Commission, the arrival of a pork inquiry and industry spanning key electorates invariably heralded a looming election. Well, the contribution of an inquiry often comes down to who does the job and what incentives or disciplines they face. Getting either of these wrong can predestine failure against at least one of the dual tests of influence and outcome. Controversy around appointments makes it hard for an inquiry to develop the public credibility that it's needed. And over the years, a number of major inquiries have got off to a bad start in this respect, including the West Review of Higher Education that I was on myself, the Brax Auto Review, and most recently, the McCallum and et al. In, uh, review of the Fair Work Act. The qualities of the people involved in an inquiry and the governance arrangements under which they operate are interconnected, and some trade-offs between them may be possible, depending on the topic being reviewed. The minimum requirement at the personal level could be expressed as competence without conflicts. Desirable additional qualities are integrity, openness of mind, and independence of spirit. Admittedly, these are demanding requirements and people with all of them are not in abundant supply. Now, governments will often be torn between their natural inclination to appoint a person they trust, someone well disposed, and the desirability of that person having wider credibility with the public. There will generally be scope to find such people if a government tries hard enough. And Professor Carmel's appointment to the Schools Review in 1973 exemplifies this, and I could cite several others. Trying hard in this area is important as such appointments typically receive intense scrutiny from interested stakeholders. They will rightly see the qualities and connections of an appointee as having an important bearing on their chances of at least getting a good hearing, if not the outcome they want. A review that cannot withstand such scrutiny will struggle to get broad participation in its processes or for its recommendations to be accepted as being in the public interest. The more independent the institutional setting for an inquiry and the more rigorous and transparent are its procedures, the less reliance need be placed on the qualities of the appointees handling it. I used to muse on the ability of the Productivity Commission and its predecessors to produce consistently good reports, notwithstanding the unavoidable variation in the abilities of those involved. The explanation, I thought, was in the quality of its processes and in the dedication of its core support staff. Some of the best inquiries in the economic sphere, such as the Campbell Inquiry and the Hilmer Review, were supported by strong secretariats, including from central agencies such as the Federal Treasury. Others, such, the, such as the Hogan Review of Aged Care, 
suffered from less able or more conflicted secretariat support. A recent development is the appointment of departmental heads alongside external appointees to lead policy reviews. Examples include the Shergold, Harmer and Henry reviews. This benefits from the undoubted policy skills and experience of agency heads, but at the opportunity cost of the credibility to be gained through a more arm's length arrangement. It also deprives the government of those benefits to be had from deniability and policy learning at one remove. There will always be suspicious that the inquiry's findings and recommendations have been discussed with government ministers in advance. Now, this is an understandable concern, and indeed this practice appears to be a common one, even for arm's length reviews. Such considerations may have been behind Prime Minister Rudd's use of the term commission in his early references to the tax review. The fact that the review did not have independence commensurate with that terminology made it hard to persist with. The lack of separation from government in that review's governance was also a factor in the failure to release a draft report containing preliminary recommendations for public scrutiny and debate. If it had, much of the subsequent political trouble, not least for the Prime Minister himself, might have been averted. This leads to my fifth requirement for a successful inquiry or review, transparency, which is a key source of the value that an inquiry can add to public policy development. Now, public servants, despite their title, are neither trained nor encouraged to be open with the public, at least not when it comes to policy matters. Their main connection to the public is through their minister. Ministers vary in attitude and inclination, but most don't want their departments out consulting on sensitive policy matters that may be under consideration, at least not publicly. For one thing, anything revealed or said by departmental officials is likely to be interpreted as the minister's or government's own views. An arm's length review has value to government precisely because it is not seen as coextensive with it. This enables findings to be tested and policy options floated before reaching a settled position and without implicating government along the way. It thereby also provides an opportunity for political learning about likely reactions to different courses of action without incurring the pain of actually experiencing the worst of them. Moreover, as just noted, the public testing of preliminary ideas can serve to reveal unintended potential consequences while there's still the opportunity to avert them and to do so on the front foot rather than the back one. Now, transparency amounts to more than mere consultation. A lot of policy consultations and conversations take place these days, but few transmit meaningful information. Transparency requires that relevant interests can be fully informed about the nature of a policy problem and how particular proposals might be expected to address them. In other words, it requires that people understand what is going on in the minds of policymakers so that they are in a position of being able to tell government whether that accords with their own experience on the ground and how they are likely to be affected by particular measures. When done openly and thoroughly, the informational and political value of public consultation can be great. The Productivity Commission's inquiry into the impacts of national competition policy on the bush is one that immediately comes to mind, debunking a number of misperceptions at the time. Private consultations, on the other hand, can result in very bad policy decisions indeed, being vulnerable to capture by the organised, or could I say the impassioned, whose interests don't always coincide with those of the wider community. To the extent that there's anything akin to revealed truth in public policy, it depends more on iteration than revelation. In public inquiries, the key conduits for this are the public availability of submissions and to repeat the exposure of preliminary findings and recommendations. The lack of a draft report might have been the undoing of the tax review, even if the government had been more adept in how it chose to respond to it. 
The Industrial Relations Review also suffered for want of a draft report, which reinforced suspicions that it was merely about endorsing the status quo and closing down debate. In both of those cases, further public reviews have been signalled by the opposition, should it win power, which hopefully would at least remedy this procedural deficiency. One of the numerous sayings associated with Lord Maynard Keynes is, many a slip twixt cup and lip. Now this is very true of public inquiries. Even the best inquiry may come to naught if its report is mishandled by the commissioning government. Once again, a number of elements come into play. The key point though, is that a public inquiry can only be one input to a policy decision-making process. Decisions will ultimately be made in a political realm, where the views and skills of political leaders, including how they read the politics and their capacity to influence these, play a decisive role. Where a government is broadly supportive of an inquiry's findings, a number of factors come into play that influence its ability to get them implemented. One is how and when it chooses to release the report relative to its own response. There's no rule book here, it's a matter for political ju judgment. There are two main options. One is to release a, a report ahead of a full response, and the other is to release it with a response. Both options have been exercised often, but not always to good effect. Early release of a report enables additional lobbying to occur. It will be directed politically and behind closed doors with the intended problems that a public inquiry is intended to avoid in the first place. This approach is therefore best reserved for reports where complexity and implementation detail warrant additional testing, or where for some reason there's been no opportunity to adequately test a report's findings in advance. In my view, minority government has tipped the balance in favour of the simultaneous release of inquiry reports with a government response. Otherwise, lobbyists have the additional avenue of targeting those individual parliamentarians who find themselves fortuitously in a position of great influence, but who may lack the knowledge or incentive to distinguish the national interest from their own electoral interests. The unsatisfactory outcomes for gambling regulation and carbon policy, for example, were in large part due to the leverage that pressure groups were able to exert through one or two independents. The worst strategy of all is to keep a report under wraps for too long or to release it only in part. This can only serve to diminish the standing and the value of a public review Includingly, including ultimately in political terms. This tactic has recently been adopted by some state governments for their commissions of audit. But perhaps the most telling and ironic instance is the federal government's failure to release the report it commissioned in 2008 from the Australian Law Reform Commission, a report into the efficiency and effectiveness of public inquiries. Irrespective of the timing of a report's release, better or worse outcomes can be achieved depending on how skillfully any negotiations are conducted. Again, this is not just about clinching a deal, any deal, for the sake of early agreement and a triumphant press conference. Perhaps the best illustration of this is the mining resources rent tax, which emerged from quick and exclusive negotiations the outcome of which might best be characterised as throwing the revenue baby out with the RSPT bathwater. The coalition government's deal with the Democrats a decade before to get the GST over the line is a less extreme example. To succeed in introducing a consumption-based tax, even an imperfect one, was better than failing for a third time, but the design inflexibility that became the quid pro quo has left an increasingly costly legacy. Political negotiation can be rendered more tractable where an inquiry has helped educate the public about what is at stake. The negotiations on the NDIS, and in particular the support of the opposition, an uncommon thing, were assisted by the broadening of the public's own support for it following the Productivity Commission's inquiry. 
the aged care package, though only a single step forward when a few were called for, was at least not a step backwards. The same could not be said of gambling reform, where sound evidence, broad community support, and even signs of political will failed ultimately to prevail over vested interests. The gambling story illustrates the risks that political deals, even with allies, can get to a point where they weaken the integrity of the policy package itself. Removing a measure that's complementary to others or changing the sequencing of a, of a program's rollout from what had deliberately been devised may end up strengthening the hand of those opposing reform. In the gambling case, the perceived need for speed uh, to satisfy a key independent, contrary to the more cautious incremental approach advised by the Productivity Commission, was ultimately the undoing of real reform. Well, in conclusion, well-targeted and properly conducted, public inquiries provide a useful mechanism for penetrating complexity and countering asymmetric political pressures on government. As will have become apparent, I consider that there's more cause for employing such arrangements today than ever before. Loss of policy analytic capability within the public service, compounded by erosion of procedural protections, have made policy co-production with special commissions and task forces more of a necessity uh, than a luxury. Experience tells us that governments do not always resort to public inquiries with such noble intent. Yet when they do, there are pitfalls to avoid if their goal is to be realised. For one thing, as I said, it's crucial that the right topics be addressed in the right time frames and not too many at once. For another, that the reviews are conducted by the right people acting under the right governance arrangements. But even when all these boxes have been ticked, a successful outcome is still not assured. How the commissioning government chooses to handle the inquiry's report and how skillfully will often be the deciding factor. All that being said, policy experience in sensitive areas epitomised most recently by the 457 visa episode has led me to the view that even a poorly structured public inquiry may sometimes be better than the alternative. Thank you.